Some of Mr. Whitefield's enemies affected to suppose that he would apply these collections to his own private emolument, but I, who was intimately acquainted with him, being employed in printing his sermons and journals, etc., never had the least suspicion of his integrity, but am to this day decidedly of opinion that he was in all his conduct a perfectly honest man, and methinks my testimony in his favor ought to have the more weight, as we had no religious connection. He used, indeed, sometimes to pray for my conversion, but never had the satisfaction of believing that his prayers were heard. Ours was a mere civil friendship, sincere on both sides, and lasted to his death. The following instance will show something of the terms on which we stood. Upon one of his arrivals from England at Boston, he wrote to me that he should come soon to Philadelphia, but knew not where he could lodge when there. And he understood his old friend and host, Mr. Benezet, was removed to Germantown. My answer was, You know my house. If you can make shift with its scanty accommodations, you will be most heartily welcome. He replied that if I made that kind offer for Christ's sake, I should not miss of a reward. And I returned, Don't let me be mistaken, it was not for Christ's sake, but for your sake. One of our common acquaintance jocosely remarked that, knowing it to be the custom of the saints, when they received any favor, to shift the burden of the obligation from off their own shoulders and place it in heaven, I had contrived to fix it on earth. The last time I saw Mr. Whitefield was in London, where he consulted me about his orphan house concern and his purpose of appropriating it to the establishment of a college. He had a loud and clear voice and articulated his words and sentences so perfectly that he might be heard and understood at a great distance, especially as his auditories, however numerous, observed the most exact silence. He preached one evening from the top of the courthouse steps which are in the middle of Market Street and on the west side of 2nd Street, which crosses it at right angles. Both streets were filled with his hearers to a considerable distance. Being among the hindmost in Market Street, I had the curiosity to learn how far he could be heard by retiring backwards down the street toward the river, and I found his voice distinct till I came near Front Street, when some noise in that street obscured it. Imagining then a semicircle of which my distance should be the radius, and that if it were filled with auditors, to each of whom I allowed two square feet, I computed that he might well be heard by more than thirty thousand. This reconciled me to the newspaper accounts of his having preached to twenty-five thousand people in the fields, and to the ancient histories of generals haranguing whole armies of which I had sometimes doubted. By hearing him often, I came to distinguish easily between sermons newly composed and those which he had often preached in the course of his travels. His delivery of the latter was so improved by frequent repetitions that every accent, every emphasis, every modulation of voice was so perfectly well turned and well placed that without being interested in the subject, one could not help being pleased with the discourse a pleasure of much the same kind with that received from an excellent piece of music. This is an advantage itinerant preachers have over those who are stationary, as the latter cannot well improve their delivery of a sermon by so many rehearsals. His writing and printing from time to time gave great advantage to his enemies. Unguarded expressions and even erroneous opinions delivered in preaching might have been afterwards explained or qualified by supposing others that might have accompanied them, or they might have been denied, but litera scripted Monet. Critics attacked his writings violently, and with so much appearance of reason as to diminish the number of his votaries and prevent their increase, so that I am of opinion if he had never written anything, he would have left behind him a much more numerous and important sect and his reputation might, in that case, have been still growing, even after his death, as there being nothing of his writing on which to found a censure and give him a lower character. His proselytes would be left at liberty to feign for him as great a variety of excellence as their enthusiastic admiration might wish him to have possessed. My business was now continually augmenting, and my circumstances growing daily easier. My newspaper, having become very profitable, 
as being for a time almost the only one in this and the neighboring provinces. I experienced, too, the truth of the observation, that after getting the first hundred pound, it is more easy to get the second, money itself being of a prolific nature. The partnership at Carolina having succeeded, I was encouraged to engage in others and to promote several of my workmen, who behaved well by establishing them with printing houses in different colonies, on the same terms with that in Carolina. Most of them did well, being enabled at the end of our term, six years, to purchase the type of me and go on working for themselves, by which means several families were raised. Partnerships often finish in quarrels, but I was happy in this that mine were all carried on and ended amicably, owing, I think, a good deal to the precaution of having very explicitly settled in our articles everything to be done by or expected from each partner, so that there was nothing to dispute, which precaution I would therefore recommend to all who enter into partnerships, for whatever esteem partners may have for and confidence in each other at the time of contract, little jealousies and disgusts may arise, with idea of inequality in the care and burden of the business, etc., which are attended often with breach of friendship and of the connection, perhaps with lawsuits and other disagreeable consequences. I had, on the whole, abundant reason to be satisfied with my being established in Pennsylvania. There were, however, two things that I regretted, there being no provision for defense, nor for a complete education of youth, no militia, nor any college. I therefore in 1743 drew up a proposal for establishing an academy, and at that time, thinking the Reverend Mr. Peters, who was out of employ, a fit person to superintend such an institution, I communicated the project to him, but he, having more profitable view in the service of the proprietaries, which succeeded, declined the undertaking, and, not knowing another at that time suitable for such a trust, I let the scheme lie a while dormant. I succeeded better the next year, 1744, in proposing and establishing a philosophical society. The paper I wrote for that purpose will be found among my writings when collected. With respect to defense, Spain, having been several years at war against Great Britain, and being at length joined by France, which brought us into great danger, and the labored and long-continued endeavor of our Governor Thomas to prevail with our Quaker Assembly to pass a militia law, and make other provisions for the security of the province, having proved abortive, I determined to try what might be done by a voluntary association of the people. To promote this, I first wrote and published a pamphlet entitled Plain Truth, in which I stated our defenseless situation in strong lights, with the necessity of union and discipline for our defense, and promised to propose in a few days an association to be generally signed for that purpose. The pamphlet had a sudden and surprising effect. I was called upon for the instrument of association, and having settled the draft of it with a few friends, I appointed a meeting of the citizens in the large building before mentioned. The house was pretty full. I had prepared a number of printed copies, and provided pens and ink dispersed all over the room. I harangued them a little on the subject, read the paper and explained it, and then distributed the copies, which were eagerly signed, not the least objection being made. When the company separated and the papers were collected, we found above twelve hundred hands, and, other copies being dispersed in the country, the subscribers amounted at length to upward of ten thousand. These all furnished themselves as soon as they could with arms, formed themselves into companies and regiments, chose their own officers, and met every week to be instructed in the manual exercise and other parts of military discipline. The women, by subscriptions among themselves, provided silk colors, which they presented to the companies, painted with different devices and mottos which I supplied. The officers of the companies, composing the Philadelphia Regiment, being met, chose me for their colonel, but, conceiving myself unfit, I declined that station and recommended Mr. Lawrence, a fine person and man of influence, who was accordingly appointed. 
I then proposed a lottery to defray the expense of building a battery below the town and furnishing it with cannon. It filled expeditiously and the battery was soon erected, the Merlins being framed of log and filled with earth. We bought some old cannon from Boston, but these not being sufficient, we wrote to England for more, soliciting at the same time our proprietaries for some assistance, though without much expectation of obtaining it. Meanwhile, Colonel Lawrence, William Allen, Abram Taylor, Esquire, and myself were sent to New York by the Associators, commissioned to borrow some cannon of Governor Clinton. He at first refused us preemptorily, but at dinner with his council, where there was great drinking of Madeira wine, as the custom of that place then was, he softened by degrees and said he would lend us six. After a few more bumpers he advanced to ten, and at length he very good-naturedly conceded eighteen. They were fine cannon, eighteen-pounders, with their carriages, which we soon transported and mounted on our battery, where the associators kept a nightly guard while the war lasted, and among the rest I regularly took my turn of duty there as a common soldier. My activity in these operations was agreeable to the governor and council. They took me into confidence, and I was consulted by them in every measure wherein their concurrence was thought useful to the association. Calling in the aid of religion, I proposed to them the proclaiming a fast to promote reformation and implore the blessing of heaven on our undertaking. They embraced the motion, but, as it was the first fast ever thought of in the province, the secretary had no precedent from which to draw the proclamation. My education in New England, where a fast is proclaimed every year, was here of some advantage. I drew it in the accustomed style, it was translated into German, printed in both languages, and divulged through the province. This gave the clergy of the different sects an opportunity of influencing their congregations to join in the association, and it would probably have been general among all but Quakers if the peace had not soon intervened. It was thought by some of my friends that, by my activity in these affairs, I should offend that sect, and thereby lose my interest in the assembly of the province, where they formed a great majority. A young gentleman, who had likewise some friends in the house, and wished to succeed me as their clerk, acquainted me that it was decided to displace me at the next election, and he, therefore, in good will, advised me to resign as more consistent with my honor than being turned out. My answer to him was that had I read or heard of some public man who made it a rule never to ask for an office, and never to refuse one when offered to him, I approve, says I, of his rule, and will practice it with a small addition. I shall never ask, never refuse, nor ever resign an office. If they will have my office of clerk to dispose of to another, they shall take it from me. I will not, by giving it up, lose my right of some time or other, making reprisals on my adversaries. I heard, however, no more of this. I was chosen again, unanimously, as usual at the next election. Possibly, as they disliked my late intimacy with the members of council, who had joined the governors in all the disputes about military preparations, with which the house had long been harassed, they might have been pleased if I would voluntarily have left them. But they did not care to displace me on account merely of my zeal for the association, and they could not well give another reason. Indeed, I had some cause to believe that the defense of the country was not disagreeable to any of them, provided they were not required to assist in it. And I found that a much greater number of them than I could have imagined, though against offensive war, were clearly for the defensive. Many pamphlets, pro and con, were published on the subject, and some by good Quakers, in favor of defense, which I believe convinced most of their younger people. A transaction in our fire company gave me some insight into their prevailing sentiments. It had been proposed that we should encourage the scheme for building a battery by laying out the present stock, then about sixty pounds, in tickets of the lottery. By our rules, no money could be disposed of till the next meeting after the proposal. The company consisted of thirty members, of which twenty-two were Quakers, and eight only of other persuasions. We eight punctually attended the meeting, but though we thought that some of the Quakers would join us, we were by no means sure of a majority. Only one Quaker, 
Mr. James Morris, appeared to oppose the measure. He expressed much sorrow that it had ever been proposed, as he said friends were all against it, and it would create such discord as might break up the company. We told him that we saw no reason for that, we were the minority, and if friends were against the measure, and outvoted us, we must, and should, agreeably to the usage of all societies, submit. When the hour for business arrived, it was moved to put the vote. He allowed we might then do it by the rules, but, as he could assure us that a number of members intended to be present for the purpose of opposing it, it would be but candid to allow a little time for their appearing. While we were disputing this, a waiter came to tell me two gentlemen below desired to speak with me. I went down and found they were two of our Quaker members. They told me that there were eight of them assembled at a tavern just by, that they were determined to come and vote with us if there should be occasion, which hoped would not be the case, and desired we would not call for their assistance if we could do without it, as their voting for such a measure might embroil them with their elders and friends. Being thus secure of a majority, I went up, and, after a little seeming hesitation, agreed to a delay of another hour. This Mr. Morris allowed to be extremely fair. Not one of his opposing friends appeared, at which he expressed great surprise, and, at the expiration of the hour, we carried the resolution eight to one, and, as of the twenty-two Quakers, eight were ready to vote with us, and thirteen by their absence manifested that they were not inclined to oppose the measure, I afterward estimated the proportion of Quakers sincerely against defense as one to twenty-one only, for these were all regular members of that society, and in good reputation among them, and had due notice of what was proposed at that meeting. The honorable and learned Mr. Logan, who had always been of that sect, was one who wrote an address to them, declaring his approbation of defensive war, and supporting his opinion by many strong arguments he put into my hands sixty pounds to be laid out in lottery tickets for the battery, with directions to apply what prizes might be drawn wholly to that service. He told me the following anecdote of his old master, William Penn, respecting defense. He came over from England when a young man, with that proprietary and as his secretary, it was wartime and their ship was chased by an armed vessel supposed to be an enemy. Their captain prepared for defense, but told William Penn and his company of Quakers that he did not expect their assistance, and they might retire into the cabin, which they did, except for James Logan, who chose to stay upon deck, and was quartered to a gun. The supposed enemy proved a friend, so there was no fighting, but when the secretary went down to communicate the intelligence, William Penn rebuked him severely for staying upon deck and undertaking to assist in defending the vessel contrary to the principles of friends, especially as it had not been required by the captain. This reproof, being before all the company, piqued the secretary, who answered, I, being thy servant, why did thee not order me to come down? But thee was willing enough that I should stay and help to fight the ship when thee thought there was danger. My being many years in the assembly, the majority of which were constantly Quakers, gave me frequent opportunities of seeing the embarrassment given them by their principle against war, whenever application was made to them, by order of the crown, to grant aids for military purposes. They were unwilling to offend government, on the one hand, by a direct refusal, and their friends, the body of the Quakers, on the other, by a compliance contrary to their principles, hence a variety of evasions to avoid complying, and modes of disguising the compliance when it became unavoidable. The common mode at last was to grant money under the phrase of it being for the king's use, and never to inquire how it was applied. But if the demand was not directly from the crown, that phrase was found not so proper, and some other was to be invented. As when powder was wanting, I think it was for the garrison at Lewisburg, and the government of New England solicited a grant of some from Pennsylvania, which was much urged on by the House of Governor Thomas, they could not grant money to buy powder, because that was an ingredient of war. But they voted an aid to New England of three thousand pounds to be put into the hands of the governor, and appropriated it for the purchasing of bread, flour, wheat, or other grain. Some of the council, desirous of giving the house still further embarrassment, advised the governor not to accept provision, 
as not being the thing he had demanded. But he replied, I shall take the money, for I understand very well their meaning. Other grain is gunpowder, which he accordingly bought, and they never objected to it. It was an allusion to this fact, when on our fire company we feared the success of our proposal in favor of the lottery, and I had said to my friend Mr. Singh, one of our members, If we fail, let us move the purchase of a fire engine with the money. The Quakers can have no objection to that, and then, if you nominate me and I you as a committee for that purpose, we will buy a great gun, which is certainly a fire engine. I see, says he, you have improved by being so long in the assembly. Your equivocable project would be just a match for their wheat or other grain. These embarrassments that the Quakers suffered from having established and published it as one of their principles that no kind of war was lawful, and which, being once published, they could not afterwards, however they might change their minds, easily get rid of, reminds me of what I think a more prudent conduct in another sect among us, that of the Dunkers. I was acquainted with one of its founders, Michael Welfare, soon after it appeared. He complained to me that they were grievously calumniated by the zealots of other persuasions, and charged with abominable principles and practices, to which they were utter strangers. I told him this had always been the case with new sects, and that to put a stop to such abuse, I imagined it might be well to publish the articles of their belief and the rules of their discipline. He said that had been proposed among them, but not agreed to for this reason. When we were first drawn together as a society, says he, it had pleased God to enlighten our minds so far as to see that some doctrines, which we once esteemed truths, were errors, and that others, which we had esteemed errors, were real truths. From time to time he has been pleased to afford us farther light, and our principles have been improving, and our errors diminishing. Now we are not sure that we are arrived at the end of this progression, and at the perfection of spiritual or theological knowledge, and we fear that, if we should once print our confession of faith, we should feel ourselves as if bound and confined by it, and perhaps be unwilling to receive farther improvement, and our successors still more so, as conceiving what we, their elders and founders, had done to be something sacred never to be departed from. This modesty in a sect is perhaps a singular instance in the history of mankind, every other sect supposing itself in possession of all truth, and that those who differ are so far in the wrong. Like a man traveling in foggy weather, those at some distance before him on the road he sees wrapped up in the fog, as well as all those behind him, and also the people in the fields on each side, but near him all appears clear, though in truth he is as much in the fog as any of them. To avoid this kind of embarrassment, the Quakers have of late years been gradually declining the public service in the assembly and in the magistracy, choosing rather to quit their power than their principle. In order of time, I should have mentioned before that having, in 1742, invented an open stove for the better warming of rooms, and at the same time saving fuel, as the fresh air admitted was warmed in entering, I made a present of the model to Mr. Robert Grace, one of my early friends who, having an iron furnace, found the casting of the plates for these stoves a profitable thing, as they were growing in demand. To promote that demand, I wrote and published a pamphlet entitled, An Account of the New Invented Pennsylvania Fireplaces, wherein their construction and manner of operation is particularly explained, their advantages above every other method of warming rooms demonstrated, and all objections that have been raised against the use of them answered and obviated, etc. This pamphlet had a good effect. Governor Thomas was so pleased with the construction of this stove, as described in it, that he offered to give me a patent for the sole vending of them for a term of years, but I declined it from a principle which has ever weighed with me on such occasions, viz., that we enjoy great advantages from the inventions of others, we should be glad of an opportunity to serve others by any invention of ours, and this we should do freely and generously. An ironmonger in London, however, assuming a great deal of my pamphlet and working it up into his own and making some small changes in the machine, which rather hurt its operation, got a patent for it there and made, as I was told, a little fortune by it. 
and this is not the only instance of patents taken out for my inventions by others, though not always with the same success, which I never contested, as having no desire of profiting by patents myself and hating disputes. The use of these fireplaces in many houses, both of this and the neighboring colonies, has been, and is, a great saving of wood to the inhabitants. Peace being concluded, and the association business therefore at an end, I turned my thoughts again to the affair of establishing an academy. The first step I took was to associate in the design a number of active friends, of whom the junto furnished a good part. The next was to write and publish a pamphlet entitled Proposals Relating to the Education of Youth in Pennsylvania. This I distributed among the principal inhabitants gratis, and as soon as I could suppose their minds a little prepared by the perusal of it, I set on foot a subscription for opening and supporting an academy. It was to be paid in quotas yearly for five years. By so dividing it, I judged the subscription might be larger, and I believe it was so, amounting to no less, if I remember right, than five thousand pounds. In the introduction to these proposals, I stated their publication, not as an act of mine, but of some public-spirited gentleman, avoiding as much I could, according to my usual rule, the presenting myself to the public as the author of any scheme for their benefit. The subscribers, to carry the project into immediate execution, chose out of their number 24 trustees, and appointed Mr. Francis, then Attorney General, and myself, to draw up constitutions for the government of the Academy, which, being done and signed, a house was hired, masters engaged, and the schools opened, I think in the same year, 1749. The scholars increasing fast, the house was soon found too small, and we were out looking for a piece of ground, properly situated, with intention to build, when Providence threw into our way a large house ready built, which, with a few alterations, might well serve our purpose. This was the building before mentioned, erected by the hearers of Mr. Whitefield, and was obtained for us in the following manner. It is to be noted that the contributions to this building being made by people of different sects, care was taken in the nomination of trustees in whom the building and ground was to be vested, that a predominancy should not be given to any sect, lest in time that predominancy might be a means of appropriating the whole to the use of such sect, contrary to the original intention. It was therefore that one of each sect was appointed, viz., one Church of England man, one Presbyterian, one Baptist, one Moravian, etc. Those, in case of vacancy by death, were to fill it by election from among the contributors. The Moravian happened not to please his colleagues, and on his death they resolved to have no other of that sect. The difficulty then was how to avoid having two of some other sect by means of the new choice. Several persons were named, and for that reason not agreed to. At length, one mentioned me, with the observation that I was merely an honest man, and of no sect at all, which prevailed with them to choose me. The enthusiasm which existed when the house was built had long since abated, and its trustees had not been able to procure fresh contributions for paying for the ground rent and discharging some other debts the building had occasioned, which embarrassed them greatly. Being now a member of both sets of trustees, that for the building and that for the academy, I had good opportunity of negotiating with both, and brought them finally to an agreement, by which the trustees for the building were to cede it to those of the academy, the latter undertaking to discharge the debt, to keep forever open in the building a large hall for occasional preachers, according to the original intention, and maintain a free school for the instruction of poor children. Writings were accordingly drawn, and, on paying the debts of the trustees of the academy, were put into possession of the premises, and by dividing the great and lofty hall into stories, and different rooms above and below for the several schools, and purchasing some additional ground, the whole was soon made fit for our purpose, and the scholars removed into the building. The care and trouble of agreeing with the workmen, purchasing materials and superintending the work fell upon me, and I went through it the more cheerfully, as it did not then interfere with my private business, 
having the year before taken a very able, industrious, and honest partner, Mr. David Hall, with whose character I was well acquainted, as he had worked for me four years. He took off my hands all care of the printing office, paying me punctually my share of the profits. This partnership continued eighteen years successfully for both of us. The trustees of the academy, after a while, were incorporated by a charter from the government. Their funds were increased by contributions in Britain and grants of land from the proprietaries, to which the assembly has since made considerable addition and thus was established the present University of Philadelphia. I have been continued one of its trustees from the beginning, now nearly forty years, and have had the great pleasure of seeing a number of the youth who have received their education in it, distinguished by their improved abilities, serviceable in public stations, and ornaments to their country. When I disengaged myself, as above mentioned, from private business, I flattered myself that, by the sufficient though moderate fortune I had acquired, I had secured leisure during the rest of my life for philosophical studies and amusements. I purchased all Dr. Spence's apparatus, who had come from England to lecture here, and I proceeded in my electrical experiments with great alacrity, but the public now, considering me as a man of leisure, laid hold of me for their purposes, every part of our civil government, 